Oh, thanks. That's very nice of you all. Uh, I'm Chris Eveling. I'm Ben Skinner. And we are from the UTS Animal Logic Academy. Yep. We're here to talk to you about our process uh, approaching virtual production. Uh, quickly, just about us. Uh, myself, I've got over a decade of experience in film, games, TV, and uh, interactive media. And Ben? Uh, yeah, recent graduate from the, the master's program itself, um, kind of with a focus on real time uh, and pipeline as well. Ben was such an outstanding student that we couldn't let him go, so we actually hired him before other companies could, um, which cost us a bit, but they won't let me escape. You're worth it so far. Um, over the next 35 minutes, we're just going to give you a quick intro to the academy, uh, just so you know how we work and our processes, because that's quite innovative in its own right. And then uh, Ben's going to give a more detailed um, pipeline discussion, talk about how we implement USD, un uh, Pixar's universal scene descriptor, and then a technical breakdown of our virtual production setup. And then hopefully a live demo and a bit of a Q&A. Fingers crossed for the live demo. Uh, so about the Academy, why do we exist? So we are uh, established, we UTS, huge brand, big, big uh, university here in Australia. And Animal Logic, one of the big top film studios in the world, have merged together to try to bridge the gap between student and industry. We don't only focus on uh, film, but we focus on the future of digital content making, which is you know, VR, AR, LiDAR scanning, all the fun stuff. Uh, we're here to strengthen the local uh, talent pool in Australia. So what, what big companies in Australia are seeing, or VFX, they're flying a lot of talent in from overseas. We can home grow that talent here. There is enough talent here to do that. We've, we've set up a studio or an academy, which is pretty much like a, bird, like a real studio. We run nine to five, five days a week for 11 months. It's full time and it's practically led. Uh, it's grounded on STEAM philosophies, uh, industry focused, industry led, as I said, I'm from industry. My two co-leads who couldn't be here today are from industry. We've over, over 40 years of industry experience working on the Lego movie to DC comic games and everything in between. Uh, we established ourselves as a real world uh, VFX facility and tech facility where we focus also as a research center. We're doing some pretty exciting research uh, in storytelling and mixed reality and neural networking and, and much, much more. So if you're interested in research, please um, get in touch. Uh, we don't only fo focus, I just want to mention the transferable skills. So we don't only focus on transferable skills in terms of the soft skills or the ones that I call hard skills. Um, you know, we, are, we get everybody together, let's say you are the academy, we get you all to work together on one project. So again, there, there's, there's a soft skill component on how you collaborate. However, we also get people who have fine arts backgrounds and don't have any digital experience, but we see potential in them and we can transfer those skills into digital content making. As well as that, in a VFX pipeline, so that's film, we also focus on transferring those skills into real-time development, where you guys, I mean, yeah, there's a big difference and a big gap there. Um, quickly, uh, about some of the projects that we've created. So we're third year running. In our first year, we created Terra Chi, which you can try at the showcase uh, right, right now, which uh, won an award, which was pretty special. That was 19 students who created um, a full-on uh, VR application, which is on Vive Store, Viveport as well, in 16 weeks. So they were working pretty hard in those 16 weeks. Uh, rear windows in the middle, which, which actually spawned some of our virtual production you know, yeah. visions, uh, which Ben will touch on just briefly. Uh, it uses the HoloLens, which uh, lovely Lawrence Crumpton we'll talk about next, uh, as well as um, VR, and it mixes realities around a uh, tangible set, so, which is really cool. So you got a little tangible set, you can put on your HoloLens, little digital characters come to life, you can jump into VR and you can step into that story. And then the, you can do all sorts of cool interaction between the two users. Users can see each other, and it's a lot of fun. So, and then the Color Thief, which was a fully animated feature, however, was our first test bed for our virtual production setup, which we're going to talk about very shortly. Uh, really quickly, early results have been great. We're again, with, it's the third year running. We have an 85% uh, graduate success, which is really, really good. And it's not just for the film industry, but also for the real time industry. So our students are hitting the ground running. They're getting out there. The feedback we're getting is great. Where they're being globally recognized. They're being flown overseas to London, to, Bank, uh, no, to Montreal. And we've won some awards. Um, Ben will talk about one of them, Turret, later, which is um, a cool piece of code that he helped develop. Uh, 
and that won a Seagraph Award at uh, Vancouver last year, uh, Seagraph Pipeline Award. And to just to give you an idea of what level of work that is, uh, the winners of that award before us uh, was DreamWorks, PsyOps, and 2K Entertainment. We were the first educational f facility to win that. 50-50 uh, gender split, absolutely important. Uh, just looking into the room right now, it's very male dominant. This industry is super male dominant. But we've so far in the three cohorts that we've had, we've had a 50-50 split of females getting into the workforce, which is great. I've worked in the industry for yeah, 10 years, uh, over 10 years, and it's been always like an 80-20% split, which, you know, it's good. All right, uh, a little show reel, so I'll stop talking. The visuals will do some uh, talking for us on the processes and how we work in the academy. So that was uh, one thing to mention that that was all student work, all student develop, which we're very, very, very proud of. All right, so segueing into what is virtual pr production, uh, I'll stop my sales pitch and we'll <laughs> jump into what we're here for. Um, so there's a current industry shift. You know, uh, people like John Favreau, uh, James Cameron, and Steven Spielberg, and more more directors out there are using virtual production in a means to creatively empower themselves to make movies. We're trying to find a way as well to bridge that gap and how we can implement it in our education and how we can empower our students also to get an experience of that and then also how to develop within this field. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, you know, um, empowering the creatives, simple, and it's, it brings down production costs and it allows for quick iteration, which is absolutely amazing. And we've seen amazing effects of that. So without a further ado, Mr. Benjamin Skinner. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we kind of go into like the technical breakdown of everything that we've done at the Academy, it's kind of important to see where we've come because we have more of a, a film and a visual effects background. Uh, so we'll be having a look at kind of how uh, information flows through uh, our pipeline, turret, which Chris briefly touched upon, which was a USD plugin, which won a SIGGRAPH award, and how that all works in, in the Unity ecosystem. As uh, uh, an overview of our tech stack, we mainly use Shotgun as our primary overarching management kind of sy system. Uh, and so tasks can be assigned to artists and information is tracked as it flows through the pipeline. Uh, underneath everything, we use Pixar's universal scene description. Uh, and that kind of is more than just a file format. It tracks how scene hierarchies are um, taken from the beginning of the film all the way to the end. And that has integrations into uh, Maya and Houdini uh, and all the other DCCs that we use, um, ultimately ending up using RenderMan to render um, our films and Unity, of course, more and more. And so on that, we have Turret. And so Turret was a plugin for USD. Uh, USD has a, a, an idea of referencing things and usually use file paths. Um, and so for us, we have lots and lots of assets being pumped out every day by the students, and that needs to have some kind of representation which is more than just a file path. 
so we gave a whole talk about this, but essentially it boils down to something kind of like a URL. It's a, it's a URI, which uh, has a whole bunch of asset fields, which you can see there. Uh, and here's kind of a bit of a breakdown, uh, all kind of boiling down to our C++ plugin, converting the query into a file path. Um, so it's great because we get the latest file path as soon as things are published and it hooks straight into Shotgun. But it also means that as we've transitioned to Windows for Unity, it, we can just ask it for a Windows file path and it gives us that right away. And it might be worth mentioning that we're going to open source this. We are open sourcing this, open yeah. sourcing this on GitHub. Yeah. This GitHub. month, technically. This month, technically. As long as everything goes okay. Yeah. Um, so as we kind of transitioned into using Unity more and more with the USD side of things, uh, we were very quickly able to build USD and Turret on Windows. And uh, this was fairly seamless, thanks to all the work that Jeremy Cowles and the team at Unity Thank are you, doing. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much if you're watching. Thank yeah. you. Um, they created the Unity USD SDK, and so that's getting built more and more. Um, but for us, it allows us to use the same plugin that we've used on our Linux ecosystem right in Windows inside of Unity. And it is fairly plug and pay, play. And, and, and finally, it gives us the, the option to have the same shot level USD files which describe everything in the scene and open them straight up in Unity. Here's kind of a showcase of that. The top is USD view which is uh, the program that Pixar ship along with USD. It's kind of a ground truth for everything that's in the files that we see go through our pipeline. Uh, and in the bottom, we can see it in Unity as well. Um, there are some considerations when you're taking film quality assets into Unity, and some of these are listed here. Uh, for us, poly count was quite a big thing. Uh, artists um, have all the, the tools they need to create the assets are really high quality. Uh, but when you're doing these pre-visualizations in Unity, you don't often need that level of detail. Um, and so in, we've actually created a Houdini little um, thing, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, which automatically generates the level of details whenever they're published. And that hooks straight into Shotgun as well. There's like a little event system going on. And animation caches were also a, a big thing of consideration, because if we have high poly uh, character caches coming through, then it's going to obviously not run at real-time frame rates. Uh, but thankfully, they animate with a calamari rig, it's sometimes called. It's, it's like a low poly version, which has more control over the character and without, with a less of a, a poly count. And so with a simple change to things and how it worked, we're able to reuse that. Uh, and textures were something that we're still working on. Um, the USD kind of specification um, does support textures and UDIMs, but the actual Unity plugin um, doesn't support UDIMs at the moment. It does kind of support textures in a basic format. Um, but for us, that's a, a really big stretch goal that we're going to try to hit this year. And out of Unity into the pipeline, this is a really important step because it's all good to have great software inside of Unity, but if we can't get it back and render it on the screen, then it's not much use. Um, but thankfully, the USD plugin also allows you to export things, and we actually export our performances and our cameras as different, uh, ca uh, different takes, and so these are actual cameras which you can then pick between after the fact. And it also means that if we're importing um, kind of dolly movements from Maya into Unity and then filming stuff on top, the additive camera performance is kind of adjustable. So those base dolly tracks can be updated and you can kind of reuse some of the, the performance you've got there. So we can get kind of, we can set our keyframe animation and you can send your camera going down the line there. You can sit on top of it now and then give it a nice little handheld fidelity, mm -hmm. which is really hard to keyframe animate. Yeah, more of that later. Yeah. The LOD generation is also something we can uh, kind of briefly talk about. There is a whole talk in this on its own. Uh, we use PDG and Houdini's top nets, which are a new feature in Houdini 17.5. Um, and it kind of lets you lay out the pipeline steps that you would normally do all in code, uh, but with little nodes, which then have their own callbacks into code. Um, that also works straight into Shotgun and Python. So in between all those nodes, there's, there's kind of, yeah, calls into different departments and different parts of our pipeline. And it all gets bundled up uh, as a USD variant set, which is a native thing to USD, which means that something in your scene can have different variations. And so for us, that takes its place as level of detail models. And we can actually select them in Unity, which is kind of the important thing. So that's kind of the pipeline, why we, the things that we need to take into consideration. And then this kind of talks more about the implementation of our virtual production system. A little bit of an overview there, kind of had a bit of the history and uh, the focusing on virtual production uh, and some high level goals, requirements, breakdown and fingers crossed a demo. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we have kind of a history of the real time side of things at the academy. Uh, as a student last year, as I mentioned, uh, they kind of showcased everything that was done in the first year and Rear Windows was the one that kind of stood out to me because it really kind of allowed you to direct the story in your own way. The content was all there, but you're just kind of voyeuristically looking through and you can frame things how you want and almost tell a new story. 
And so that kind of stood out and the mixture between the physical set and the digital content. And I was like, there's so many cool things you could do with this um, and kind of spurred on lots of these little thoughts. We also had research which was done by uh, Andrew Bluff, one of our postdoctoral researchers. And that in the bottom right, you can see that was some of the work that he started to do. Um, it was all kind of based around FBX models and kind of off pipeline in every aspect. Um, but it was a start and again, it kind of led into the, the hooks that you see into the work we've done. And that was also used a little bit in Color Thief last year, which was our uh, animation for that. Um, but again, mostly using FBXs to get data in and out. Um, no real USD in there. And then 2019. Oh yeah. This year. Exciting. We have an intro uh, we're introducing our system, uh, a little bit of a fun time. It's called the PVC system, uh, the prototype virtual camera. Definitely didn't get its name because it's made out of PVC. We actually have it here. We'll talk more about why we've used PVC, um, but it's, yeah, it's a little bit of fun. Um, and we hope. It's like giant Lego. It is. It's, it's actually like very fun. <laughs> um, so we have some high level goals going into the PVC system. Uh, we wanted to make sure that filmmakers had all the tools they needed and it was really easy for them to express themselves. Uh, and that kind of is in every part of the, the process. And it also meant that the design that we had to come up with had to be fairly modular. If they wanted to hop in in VR, they needed to be able to do that. If they wanted to use a physical rig with actual production hardware, we also wanted to support that. And it also meant recording the performance one-to-one, -one, so they wouldn't want to record something and then come back and be like, oh, it's totally wrong. Um, it needed to be fairly accurate. And one thing you find when you're actually doing some of these camera moves, you actually want it to simulate like a real camera. So bringing this rig on your shoulder and being able to weight it down yeah. will give you that real physical shift so it gets it even more fidelity when you're looking at it in virtual reality. Mm. So. Yeah, considering the name virtual camera, there is actually a lot of kind of physicality in the yeah. movements you get. It also lended itself to VR scouting, so we could actually get in these sets that our students are making. We could get them in there and they could see things from a whole new level. They could get inside of things, they could see all different things and maybe be like, oh, we want to set up a shot here. And then we'd able to record that and then get it straight back in. And on that, it had to fit fairly well with our pipeline. So with the whole idea of USD, going in and out, uh, and just making that process a lot easier. Streamlining it. Mm. Yeah. And kind of overarching, and, and why we did it, was we wanted to find somewhere in the middle. You kind of see all these things that Jim, James Cameron was doing, uh, and a lot of the other things that you can learn about, <laughs> very much so. Um, but that's kind of like, for us at least, it was kind of a, a world away, almost, in terms of budget, and budget. in terms of just resources, technical skill, resources yeah. in every way. Yeah. Uh, and there were lots of people kind of doing it on their phone, and like even you get little apps that do it, but it wasn't kind of, in a way we could put it into our projects. And so that's kind of where we wanted to be, somewhere in the middle where we could use consumer hardware, uh, which was affordable, yeah. and also just still allow for the creative to just come a, through. a trip to Bunnings and you know an iPhone. Yeah, lots of trips to Bunnings. Well, a lot of trips to Bunnings. Too many trips I to hope Bunnings. you kept those receipts. I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Too many receipts. Um, yeah, so that kind of hooks into our use case. We wanted to have some kind of location scouting and previs. We wanted to be able to record camera animations, which would then end up on the big screen. Yeah. But we still wanted to use Render Man and the whole rest of our pipeline. Yeah, there's a big push uh, by Unity and Film to try to, you know, real-time rendering and real-time ray tracing, like rendering in real time and not going offline. However, we're still very VFX heavy. We do operate as a VFX facility, and we still find that the fidelity that you can get by actually rendering offline and then comping and adding all those Houdini effects and such and such, there's just more you can put to it. However, with the recent push, it is just keeps going. So for our use of cases, it's pretty much, as it says here, so for previs, location scouting, setting up the shots, we'll then go in and we'll keyframe animate. We're very based on keyframe, but we will be doing some mocap stuff. And then for final animation polish is where that really nice fidelity is put in, where these little camera moves and little hangs and stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Um, looking at our tech requirements, that kind of also dictated how things went. Uh, again, on the 100% USD, we made advantage as much as we could on the USD, Unity SDK. We wanted to make sure everything was fairly um, yeah, versatile and extensible in design. Uh, we wanted it so that we, you could use any kind of tracking system. At the moment, we've just used what we had a lot at the university, and that was the Vive system. Um, AR Foundation has made big strides in the time we've been developing, and it's possible that Potentially for just really quick demos, you might want to hook into that. There's still some accuracy that you get with the Vive systems and with the OptiTracks, which we've got access to, and are kind of fit in that ballpark of kind of uh, um, cost-effective and, and achievable. There was also the LOD system as we looked more and more into it. And as kind of a stretch goal for where we want to go this year and in the future, we want to make sure we can get materials and our whole surfacing pipeline in there, and potentially, yeah, make advantage of RTX and Unity's HDRP as well. 
Um, when those kind of two components, we have the software and we have the hardware that we were able to do. And on the hardware side, there was kind of these four or five big points which we wanted to hook into. Um, but in the early stages of the process, it really came down to tracking, how we were gonna track it and how we were gonna give that feedback of the viewport um, to the users. Input and design came into play kind of in the later stages and as we're developing, developing it now. Um, and even kind of there's some user stories uh, which we'll get on kind of on how ergonom ergonomics work as well and where you need inputs. Because sometimes you don't need every aspect of it. Well, on the camera operator, you can have like a tandem operation going. And also cost. Cost was a big thing. We also wanted to make sure that we could go and make it compatible with um, production gear that's already out there. So if you have a tripod or a, a shoulder mount or a dolly system, we wanted it to be versatile. And so we've made advantage of kind of the, the quarter inch screws and the, the mounts that they have there. Um, and that also kind of fed into the, uh, my, my little trips to Bunnings um, where I spent a lot of money with PVC pipe. Um, that kind of came from as a kid, I made like a fig rig, not sure if you know what a fig rig is, out of PVC, kind of stayed in my mind. And then as we kind of came onto this project, I was like, well, we could build kind of our project out of PVC pipes. I don't think that's us. Okay. Um, yeah, and with that, you kind of get a, a kind of requirements that you have to fit in. There's a certain number of pipes that you can use. And when the problem solving comes around to it, then it's like you've got a, a kind of like a boundaries that you can work in. Uh, and from that, you can, you can make something really cool. I don't know what that noise is. It's also really fun um, buying PVC pipes. In the future, we are going to look at carbon fiber and 3D printing and using embedded controls. Um, for, for us now, that's that. Here's some kind of progress pictures of our first and second prototypes. Um, we originally had the Vive controllers mounted inside of these tennis balls. You can pick that up, yeah, maybe. Uh, and so that allowed us to then grab on, and then you can see in the bottom, in this one, you can see Chris using it there. Uh, we then repurposed it and re rotated, rotated them the other way around, um, but it was a cool way to kind of lock in the controllers, but it wasn't really very structurally sound. Uh, and you can see also there's a repurposed uh, car cradle in there, which a phone can sit into. Um, uh, which kind of brings us on to prototype version two. Um, the actual cradle to holding the phone was kind of a, a thing which wasn't easily kind of fabricatable. Is the sound off? That's not. No? Oh, um, so this can kind of unscrew. And then we found that we could put it, this same pipe on other bits of our equipment. Um, and it just meant that it kind of, it worked for us in that. And then there's a little bit of thing here. So you can see how we put it on a tripod there uh, and how it fit onto this as well. And that kind of brings us to version three, which is also down there on the floor, uh, and what we're using for production at the moment with students. Um, you can see there's two variations here, and that kind of goes back to the ergonomics thing that was kind of mentioned before. It, originally, the, the focus and was on the front, and Chris and I have quite long arms, but then we gave it to some of the students and some of the other staff members who had shorter arms, and they found reaching all the way around to kind of adjust uh, focus and zoom, it wasn't really that great. So we've been able to move it onto the side, and that whole process was just a couple minutes with PVC. Um, I feel like I'm just trying to evangelize PVC, even though it's <laughs> it's just pipe. He works for Bun he works for Bunnings and I do. Um, but yeah, for us it was really great. Um, there's the hardware side, and then there's the software side. Uh, and so our code design kind of navigated around peripherals, managers, and handlers. Uh, peripherals were kind of our concept of um, ways to input into the virtual production system. Um, we have these, which are considered peripherals, but then we also allow you to get in there in VR and have your own kind of uh, input. Uh, we also have managers which act as kind of a singleton to the whole recording process which manage the time and the USD stage and everything like that. Uh, we have different handlers as well. So that kind of hooks into the Unity native components and the, um, the USD components as well. So the idea of cameras, um, being able to have a camera monitor which you can look at feedback of as well. Your sound. It's changed pitch. <laughs> um, regardless of the sound, um, here's kind of again our shots and sets inside of Unity. Uh, and on the, yeah, there'll be a slide shortly with a, a video of that working as well. Um, on the viewport side, when you're not working entirely in VR, it was important that you had a really low latency connection to what you were seeing from within Unity. Uh, we had three options here. And so our first one, which we used for the first project last year with uh, our virtual camera, uh, was to render it all locally. But this would require a complete mobile rebuild. It would require double the support. Our, our content had to be in two places at once and it had to all be synced up. And it also meant that the devices in the viewport we had to do, um, it required them to be quite high powerful. Um, and so it kind of worked last year, but it was a whole, it was like a two day process to get a new shot into the camera system. 
uh, which wasn't great for us. The third one would be to just get a completely wired external display, which for it would have great low latency, um, but it would have uh, restricted movements. And since the rest of our system was wireless, we wanted to make sure we could do something different. So for us, that looks like streaming. Um, and we have setups at the uni where it's, it's just on its own kind of network, and we can get rid of a lot of the traffic there. And in theory, it can support a really wide range of devices. Because we're actually using the WebRTC framework, which means that we can stream things just straight into Safari on an iPhone or Chrome on an Android. Um, and it doesn't require any client. It just requires, yeah, the internet browser. And it, it's really surprisingly how um, small of a latency there is between them. Uh, and it means there's no client, and it's just great. And in theory, you could even have different monitors all around a studio where everyone's kind of looking at and getting their own feedback. Uh, here is a little video of um, it in use, and this is so. This is the the mobile viewport. Um, the UI up the top is actually HTML elements, and so that feeds back using UDP packets to Unity, uh, and it's all very real time, which we can hopefully show in the demo. Um, we have little inputs in there where you can control how you're navigating around the scene. If there's a bit of smoothing to get a glide cam kind of feel, or if you actually want all the nitty gritty details. Um, there. There's also on the on the right is the, the focal adjustment as well. And this next video is showing the same system but in VR. So this is again using the, the Vive system uh, and we have little controls in there which you can do and you can put them out when you need to focus on filming things or you can bring them in when it's up for review. Uh, and everything kind of has a little representation so the camera has a little gizmo uh, and that kind of hooks into where the handlers were used for as well. It's probably worth noting that all the software for this were kind of made by us except for the, the USD plugin. Um, we kind of built it all up inside of Unity and the software that we had. And so you can also see that you get a really, you can change scales very quickly. So if you're looking for shots where you want more of a high advantage point, you can just zoom out and then it also almost becomes like a, a playground or like a little, um, what's the word? Sandbox. Sandbox. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, something but like it gives that. us flexibility. So yeah. from a creative standpoint, yeah. having the two differences, being able to get into VR and then being able to put yourself up on a high point and shrink yeah. everything down and give you this god boyer view mm. versus going real close and making everything big and looking from ant view is, is actually mm. super cool to play with and just gives you creative freedom as a as a director or a creative. So yeah, you also as that video just showed, you can also move things like the light sources yeah. uh, and just overall get a bit of an idea of what you're filming, which you don't get always by looking at a screen. So that's kind of where we are now. We can give a demo if it works, but in the future, this is kind of where we're going. We, we're looking at different viewport technologies. Uh, mentioned briefly in there was the USD view, uh, a kind of a side option which we're working with, which would kind of remove the need to load up sets inside of Unity is to just use USD view itself and send camera and rotation data from Unity to this viewport. Because it's really surprising and amazing what Pixar have been able to do with the viewport, the USD view. It's kind of like 90 frames a second with the actual set geometry and all the caches coming through. Um, like, really surprising, uh, yeah. Um, so we can send stuff through, which another video I can show will demonstrate that. But it still requires Unity to kind of record and track and manage the whole scene. But we're just pushing off the rendering to somewhere else. It also, something that we're looking at for is using the Unity HD render pipeline. Uh, we've kind of got some early implementation of that at this point. Uh, but as we get our RTX cards as well, that's something we really want to be using. Yes, please. And collaboration as well. So we want to be able to get multiple people in there. At this point, on the same computer, you can have two people recording and, and looking around the scene. Um, but the next steps are to network that together and have kind of um, edits being able to be made from all parties of production. Mm -hmm. And on hardware, we're looking at 3D printing things. UTS has a lot of kind of facilities to send things off and get fab things to get fabricated. Um, and for the custom input side of things, we are going to use probably the Raspberry Pi and actually get physical buttons and dials uh, and be able to send things through. Um, on the kind of the prototype for version 3, again using the Unity backend to track and record and play back things and then potentially using the Hydra front end, that's the USD view. Um, there's some positives and negatives there. It would be more performant and it would be feature compatible with everything that USD supports, which for us in our pipeline works well. But it would cut out the ability to have lighting and shadows and different post-processing effects, that which Unity provides. Um, and it also, the in-scene collaboration wouldn't work, uh, and also it wouldn't be suitable for VR. Um, I'll show this video at the end, it didn't embed properly. But on that note, um, thank you. Thank you for listening. Yep.
And we'll do a little demo and a Q&A now. Yeah, if there's any, if there's any questions, yeah. that's our next slide. Demo and questions. Demo and questions. I'll set up the demo. You yep. answer I'll the answer the questions that I can answer. Any questions? Just a demo? Just a demo. Questions? <laughs> cool. It was a very holistic talk. It answered everything. That's good. Question. We answered everything. No. Or it just went. Whew. No. Hi. <coughs> so for bridge production, how um, are you guys recording the camera in sync with a some kind of time on sequence? Um, yep. So we record it into Unity. It's in a time-based format. We've made our own data structure to support it. And then that can is we have a conversion layer to then export that back out as USD, and so that is exported as different frames along, um, which <coughs> maps into kind of our shotgun in and out points. Yeah. So is that going to be open source? <laughs> uh, potentially, yeah, yeah. If it was to be open source, it would probably be enough to get it running and recording out of it as well. Um, so we can see here. This is uh, a newer kind of addition, the ability to kind of look at it and, and um, navigate around in, on an iPad device. It was kind of more flexible for previous in that you could just move around and do different things. Um, but it does give an idea of how things work. And so you can kind of move around at great scales. Um, we also allow to smooth things as well. You're kind of blocking the sensor. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> uh, so in this, we can kind of go in and then record something just to show that it kind of all works. And this is what the artists are using at the moment. So we could go in, uh, we can press record, uh, and then we hit play, and it waits, and then starts recording. And we can move around, and then we can stop. Uh, and then we can then detach it from tracking, so it's just kind of how it is. And then we can hit play, and then it will go back to the start position, and then go through, kind of as you'd expect. And then this, in its basic form, lets people record stuff and get it back into Maya and the rest of our pipeline. Uh, and there's also the ability to kind of look throughout the timeline and just kind of do it. And the different takes that they do, then they can build them up and then export them out and be like, take three was great for me. Hmm. No, no, no. So it's all using uh, the USC plugin. There's no FBXs on screen at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where we're, our RTX machines hopefully come into play. We haven't got them yet, but they are on the cards, aren't they, Andrew? Uh, <laughs> just look at it. Um, yeah. So we're we're getting a few boxes in, and then that's where we'll play with that. And like as Ben was mentioning, you know, if we're doing the, the using the Hydra USD viewer, we won't be able to use, you know, the texture compat compatibility. So there'll be a comparison to be made there. Like ideally. What we would love to see with film, I guess, is pushing everything to 85%, 90% with lighting, effects, everything in Unity in real time, and then saying, all right, we know what we're seeing, except for that last 10%, which could be rendered offline. I think that's, that's the future. But, you know, we're, we'll get there. Next year, maybe. Yeah. This is some early animation. It's kind of our development process is lining up kind of well with our production at the moment in that uh, people are starting to get out and do actual proper final animation. And these are some of the caliber rigs you see, um, which yeah. was previously mentioned. You can also see in this demo that the camera moves itself backwards. And that's the idea of having a, a pre-animated track from somewhere like Maya uh, and then bringing it in and then adding on top um, your own motions. Just because there's some camera moves which prove too impossible to kind of film uh, we have a shot in this as well where it's just a very quick move and it's very precise, but you still kind of want that ability, kind of almost like someone's on top of uh, a car moving along the scene, yeah. um, which kind of emulates the, the, the real process as well. Let me scrub through that as well. Cool. So if they want to use this um, to take it up to the 85% mark, I know they will. Mm. Uh, No, oh, we haven't got there yet. That's the ideal world. Right. Yeah, yeah. So wherever you get to at the moment, is there key moments where you produce this or do you constantly use it? Oh, no, we're using it for previs first. So previs and location scouting. So what you're seeing here is very early animation. However, with keyframe animation, we're not using mocap mo yet. The ideal 
you know, the deal virtual production setup is you get actors in there with you and the virtual camera and virtual acting, and you record all that together, because then, then it's in sync. However, because we're keyframing this short animation, we need to get some animation there first, and it has to be rough and good enough, and that's where we just do Maya cameras. But then once that's set and we like the performance, then we can go in with the fidelity and start doing our virtual cameras. And then once animation is final, final, we'll do another pass called final layout, which is it's standard in industry to go in and just give it that little, you know, little sweetener, that little love, because yeah, we never, we're always changing things till the very end. <laughs> we're never satisfied. <coughs> But yeah, the goal would be when we get our RTX machines to be able to then do real-time lighting in there and have all the textures in there and be able to see everything at, you know, I don't think we're ever gonna go 100% fidelity, because I think offline, but that's, a discuss that's another talk, I guess. But, you know, it remains to be seen. But that's the push. Hmm. Yes? Student involvement in the project, how long was that? And from how long it so the students that we have, so Ben, Mr. Ben Skinner here, he was with us for 11 months last year. Uh, and we didn't want to let him go because he was actually driving a lot of this uh, as a student uh, with, with the research work that uh, Dr. Andrew Bluff had established, our, one of our researchers, and we pushed that on. And in the short film, The Color Thief, um, which you can see online, we got to use it in a few shots and test it, or the early days rig, which was, which was this guy, which was more of a flying, you know, flying thing and doing little moves like that. However, with the shoulder cam now, you can get some better fidelity. So. Stay tuned, this short is in the making. Uh, it's, we're 50% we're there, I wish we were 80% there, but uh, it's gonna be a busy year for the students, which is good, it's real life. Still early. It's still early. Still early. But they got a lot of work to do, which is good. Are they uh, undergrad students or they're recent? So they, this is masters, this is a, it's a masters, but uh, we, we, you don't need any um, requirements post like previous requirements. You could be a standout high school student which just has, you know, Unity chops or has been coding or has been doing amazing artwork on the side. Like we've uh, we've hired people who yeah, who don't have bachelors actually or not hired, sorry, that's the wrong term. <laughs> Accepted. Yeah. It's a bit too real world for me still. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And visit us? Yeah, let's, let's talk. We're, we can easily, we do open days and we do, you know, things where we open up for students, but we'd love to, like, our whole means is to encourage the youth and, and encourage, you know, the talent here. So if we can get them young and get them encouraged, and that would be great. So, yeah, grab a card afterwards and let's talk. Yes? So we run ba basically our own production, uh, which is like this short, the students, they go through a two week creative process to come up with an idea. This is a three minute short film that we'll be, we'll be targeting festivals globally as well. And it's, it's all about pushing innovation uh, as well as just like getting them to produce high fidelity work so they can go and say, hey, I can work in this industry. Um, we do do something where we call it, um, uh, like we do research projects, right? And so we've had, we've had uh, research with the Royal Australian Air Force, for example, helping fund one of our research projects. And we do what we call, um, it's a, what's it called? Uh, an industry challenge. And that's where an industry can come in and actually pitch an idea. Like, hey, we're having issues with X, Y, and Z, or you know, we can't get women to fly jets. And then our students uh, can go away and volunteer, volunteer and pitch to that. Um, we just don't want it to get in the way of the work that they have to do. So they can do it on the side and absolutely, you know, it's by all means. So yeah, we, could, we could talk about that, but not like direct collaboration uh, in terms of we're just going to scrap everything and all our students are going to work for a Mercedes-Benz commercial or something like that. It won't happen. Sorry, Mercedes. <laughs> Didn't mean to call them out. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.